So to understand bioinformatics or genes and genomes, you need to have some basic understanding of biochemistry. And I'm sure that most of you already know this, and if not, you should take a basic biochemistry textbook and read it up until very, very soon. So we all know that three of the most important features in a cell or in a life is DNA, RNA, and proteins. So there are other big molecules, other molecules are also important, but for what we do here, this is probably enough. So DNA and RNA building blocks are, from a biophysical point of view, consisting of only four types of uh, building blocks or nucleotides. So a, that's a famous uh, nucleotide from Watson Creek, the ACTG, or in uh, RNA, ACUG. Uh, and uh, we all know that in DNA, so the DNA consists of a sugar group, phosphate group, and a base. And the bases are in the pyrimidines or purines. And uh, you can see here on the picture that the purines are bigger and uh, the pyrimidines are smaller. And the basic idea is that you can uh, pair them up two by two, one purine, one pyrimidine. And in DNA, this is a very, very famous double helix that uh, Watson Creek came out with in the 50s, where you have a perfect pairing of G's to C's, A's to T's. So you have a perfect, nice hydrogen bonding pattern here that br brings them next to each other and as obviously as they state in the paper is that it's having this you can see how it can be easily duplicated because you can take away half a way of the double helix and just put you know the code for other half so this is a way to keep information from one generation of cell to the next generation or one single organism to the next generation So this of course explains how information is kept in cell this is what we do when we do sequence we, take, we figure out the sequence of these ACTGs. But most of the fun, so, so in the replications, you take these two cells together, two strands with helix, you break it up, and you do duplications. And we know a lot of things that you have to do. So you, you have to do the two replications in two different ways. You have the lagging and the leading strands, because just it can only happen in one way. So there's a lot of biochemistry that we started here that explains it. But from a computational point of view, it's an easy way to just copy and duplicate. RNA is similar, but the structure is more complex. So here's a picture of a tRNA. You see that it partly has a, has a double helix, but it also has other structures. And there are also bi um, hydrogen bonds, other fines that can be found between the back bases of the backbone, etc. And for a long time, I thought was that RNA's main, main job was just to copy information from the DNA and transform it into a protein. But it's also been known in the last few years that there's a lot of functions that are known where RNA is a catalysis. And many people believe that RNA was the fundamental of all life because it was the, the, the only molecule that can both copy information and also actually perform biochemical functions. So there are theories that the RNA were before the world existed. And, but of course, the central dogma that basically takes you, they have the DNA, they can be replicated, you can do new copies of it. And then you can do synthesized RNA called transcription, that is single stranded, you get an mRNA. And then this mRNA is uh, used for photosynthesis or translation by the ribosome into a protein that has different amino acids. Transcription is Fundamentally, it just takes the DNA, one strand of them, the coding strand, and transcribes it to the RNA sequence. And, but to do that, the, you need a um, complex machine called the RNA polymerase that needs to rewind, unwind, and rewind the DNA double helix, and just walks on along it and synthesizes an RNA transcript. This RNA transcript then is, is actually modified and in eukaryotic cells often, so they have introns, can be started part cutting off it, it's put poly A tail on the so there's a lot of biology happening there. Translation on the other hand is even more complex, because then you need to take the four letter code RNA and transform it into a protein code. 
which has 20 letters. So to do that, you take three letters of the RNA and using the tRNA, a complex molecule that binds an amino acid and that recognizes the, the, the R mRNA. And with the help of the ribosome, you then turn this into a protein sequence. But as I said, you need three letters of RNA or DNA to go to one amino acid. And of course, three letters of RNA, so that's four to the power of three, which is 64 different possibilities. So these 64 different amino acids code, so 64 different codons code for the 20 amino acids plus a stop code, so 21 different codons. And this is basically conserved in all life. So you have the same codon more or less in every part of life. So it's a very fundamental old part of life. They occurred very, very early. There are a few modifications that exist. But you have a 64 to a 21 translation. Uh, but this also means that the reading frame is very important. Because if you add or delete one uh, codon, one, no, one nucleotide, in, in, you will get a completely different sequence. So if you start with the uh, senior lecture, you start with the uh, first uh, codon, you will have a leucine, serine, valine, threonine. But if you start with the second one, you will have a serine, alene, leucine, proline. And if you start with third, you have glutamine, arginine, tyrosine, histidine. So you will get completely different sequences by just starting the reading frame one step. So it's very important that mutations conserve the reading frames. Otherwise, you have completely changed the natural sequences. And in particular, you will quite likely acquire a stop codon because by random, three out of the 60, every 21st codon more or less should be stop codon. You have three stop codons out of 64. Okay, so that's the first start of the building blocks. I will next going to talk about proteins.